And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this evening's event with David Allen Sibley discussing the brand new edition of the Sibley Guide to Birds in conversation with Christopher Leahy. First of all, um, I want to congratulate David on the new book. Uh, fantastic. Thank you. And uh, I haven't actually had a chance to thumb through it, but um, uh, from everything I hear about it, um, um, I think it's going to live up to, to expectations and more than that. So fantastic. So we're all glad to have it. Um, Oh, it's still closer, okay. How's this? Okay. Let's see if I can adjust a little bit and then I won't have to bend over so much. Good. Okay? Yeah. All right. Um, I'd like to start, I don't get a chance to sit down and ask David, um, you know, straight on questions very often. So I'd, I'd like to start, I guess, with a little bit of background stuff. Um, going back, we'll obviously want to focus on the new book at, here shortly, but um, I'd like to talk to him a little bit about, you know, how, how all this came about in the sort of the original sense. I mean, um, there are not many people in the world that have ever made their living um, writing and illustrating bird books, and you've, you're obviously one that's been tremendously successful at that. So I'm very interested in uh, how, how that happened. You know, uh, I, I believe I know that you started very young. Did the bird stuff come first? Did the uh, Art stuff come first? How did that all go? Um, yeah, I, I, well, I did start very young. Um, as long, as young as I can remember, really, I was uh, drawing and uh, interested in birds. My father's an ornithologist, so that might have had something to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, and so there were bird books around the house. I enjoyed drawing as a kid. My parents encouraged drawing because it kept us quiet, I guess. And uh, um, I just, I, I like drawing birds, and um, when I was seven, I started keeping a life list. I enjoyed all the challenges of birding, the, the excitement of wondering what's next, of um, the challenge of identifying the birds. And, um, and I, I heard uh, Robert Bateman speak once, and he said, uh, all, all kids are artists and naturalists, and some of us just never stop. <laughs> and I think that's uh, that really rang true to me, and I certainly never stopped. Um, through, uh, right through high school and uh, on, I, uh, drawing and watching birds were the two things that I really loved to do, and the two things always went together for me. Um, that makes a lot of sense. And did you have, did you have any formal art training? Did you go to art school or? No, no formal art training. Also, um, also taught. All, um, yeah, and the, the most critical part of drawing birds, I think, is knowing the birds themselves. Um, actually, uh, so I spent, well, after high school, I went to college for almost a year, and then <laughs> I finished. <laughs> and um, after college, I went bird watching full time um, through the 1980s, and I just I spent from 1980 through um, about 1992, I was pretty much bird watching full time, 360 days a year probably, and doing lots of drawing. And those were the years that really um, where I really learned how to draw birds, what they look like, and the, when I'm doing the paintings in the field guide, I would say the most critical part of any bird painting is the outline, the, just the pencil outline of the shape of the bird. That sets, it sets up everything else. And if the outline isn't right, no amount of painting skill will save that image. Mm -hmm. You can't make it work. And, uh, and did you have, um, um, I want to talk more about that and all the, t the technique stuff as well, but uh, did you have um, other bird artists who were your kind of mentors or that you, you know, you mentioned Robert Bateman, but, uh, you know, there are, you know, well, other folks out there doing that. Did you have people that helped you with your... Uh, yeah, I, I grew up in Connecticut, so about 20 miles from where Roger Peterson lived, and I had a, a friend of my father's, Noble Proctor, who some of you probably know, um, uh, was friends with Peterson and, and uh, arranged for me to meet him a couple of times. And he was very encouraging and uh, of, a, of a young artist. And uh, so I think I grew up there in Connecticut with surrounded by bird watchers and meeting people like Roger Peterson. Um, 
doing a field guide seemed like a perfectly reasonable career path to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and your parents encouraged that? They didn't, uh, again, your yeah, brother was sympathetic, obviously. Yeah, they didn't discourage it. Uh -huh. They wanted me to go to college, but uh -huh. that... Aside from that detail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but um, you asked about other uh, mentors and, yeah. and sort of role models. The artists that I most admired as a kid were uh, Fuertes, um, Eckleberry, and then in the early 80s when I discovered the work of Lars Johnson, the Swedish bird painter, mm -hmm. I was just blown away by that. So. Yeah. No, I was fortunate to do a book with Lars, and uh, he's yeah. amazing. You know. uh, um, yeah, so um, y you said something a while ago, which certainly resonates with me, which is that you, it strikes me that to do what you do, you have to do two things and do them exquisitely well. You have to know, you have to know the birds extremely well, and you have to know, you know, you know, they're identifying features. It's not just knowing what a wimbrel looks like and appreciating that. You have to look at it in a very, very specific way. And then you have to be able to recreate, put that on paper. And that's quite a remarkable combination, actually. And, and I'm sure the fact that you kind of immersed, the fact that you immersed yourself in both of those things at the same time is why you kind of are, are able to do that. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how you're, your technique proceeds. I mean, I think for most of us, you know, if there's a red-tailed hawk sitting there, some of us could take a pencil and make a crude drawing of a rough-tailed hawk, red-tailed hawk. But, you know, m m wood warblers never stop moving. Uh, and so, can you talk a little bit about, you know, do you do field sketches and all of that process, and how then that gets to these very refined uh, paintings and mm -hmm. drawings? Yeah. The. Um, uh, that's a lot to, <laughs> a lot pick, to a, cover. pick a piece of it. <laughs> um, uh, the sketching, to me, the uh, sketching birds and identifying birds were inseparable. It's, it's a perfect mm -hmm. marriage of two things. To, to draw a bird, you have to study it and you have to learn exactly what it looks like. And I discovered all kinds of field marks and differences between species through the process of drawing. Oh, it's, um, yeah. it's a sort of formal formalization of the bird study process so that in, uh, when I sit down to draw a bird, I have to, I have to focus on every part of it. To, and I, sometimes I, I describe it as like interviewing the bird in a way. It's, and you have to go through all the basic questions. The, what shape is the head? What shape is the bill? How does the bill fit on the head? What's the proportion of the eye compared to the head? Uh, how does the head fit onto the body? Is the neck long, short, thin? Um, how does it hold its tail? All these questions, and that's just the shape of the bird. Then you get into patterns and colors. Um, so going through that whole process to, to draw a bird forced me to, um, to study it and learn all those things. Um, which then became the foundation of my bird identification knowledge. Um, so if we were to look at your field sketchbooks, would we see, um, and you, you know, you're out sketching, let's say, Magnolia Warbler, which is on the cover of the book this time, and uh, would we see a lot of pictures of Magnolia Warbler heads in different postures or uh, different, uh, or, you know, the wings and, you know, and then you put them all together in the important, very uh, important shape piece, something like that? Yeah, something like that. Um, most of my sketches were, um, they're very utilitarian. They're not, um, I sort of knew that I was working towards a field guide and I, what I wanted to learn was the the sort of technical aspects of the shape and posture of the bird. So I was always drawing profile views, even in my sketches. Um, okay. Just the way the birds are in the book, <laughs> all, okay. all from the side. Um, and, uh, uh, but I would also go out on, on a specific day, I might focus on um, the, the bills of birds, the, sometimes spend a whole day just looking at bill colors and taking notes on bill colors of different birds. Um, that was back in the days before, uh, before Google, so 
if you wanted to answer a question like, how does the bill color of bay-breasted warbler change through the months of the year? And it does. On an individual bird, the bill color changes from spring to summer to winter. You had to actually look at the birds at different seasons and take notes. You couldn't just Google a bunch of photos and look at them. All right. so, so the sketchbooks would have not only these details, but as you say, you were thinking, you were moving towards the guide, so you'd also be working on this profile that you talked about, the sort of the outline. Yeah, working on the outline and taking notes on, on the details of different seasonal changes, plumages, um, field marks. So a lot of, most of my sketches, 90, 95 percent of my sketches are only part of a bird or only a very rough outline of a bird and some scribbled notes in the margin saying things like um, brightest rufus on the tail, um, those kinds of comparative notes. Right. And then you yeah. go to the studio and using all those notes paint the final or... Yeah. So back in the studio I would have file folders filled with all these notes and sketches. Um, and I'd pull those out if I'm going to work on, say, Fox Sparrow, pull out the Fox Sparrow folder and spread out all of my notes and sketches on the table. And I would also have photographs, my own slides or other photos that people had given to me. Um, and again, it's slides <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and real <laughs> photographs, um, photos I had clipped from magazines. Um, and I'd pull books off the shelf and look up photographs in the books. And I'd spread all this information out. and um, Choose a, uh, choose a sketch that I liked, modify it a little bit maybe to get the posture and the shape just right, and transfer that onto a big sheet of paper that I'm going to paint on. And I copy that shape over several times, make slight modifications in the, the position of the head, the tail, the legs. So you'll notice in the book, a, a lot of the birds are very similar body plan, but little details like the head, the tail, and the legs are moved around. Um, that was me just taking one, <laughs> one outline of the bird and copying it over several times, making these small modifications so that it would look like it was many different sketches. Uh, and then once I had the outlines on the paper, just basically just a pencil outline, then I start painting and filling in first the shadows, then the colors, and building up the colors. And how layers. big are, the, are the, those paintings, those actual paintings? Um, they're all about 15 by 20 inches, okay. um, so about three times as big as what you see in the book. Uh, so you said something very interesting a minute ago um, about um, you, you realized that you were going towards a field guide. How old were you when you realized there, that's what you were doing? When did that happen? Um, well, I think I, was, I think I was thinking of a field guide even when I was 12 years old. Wow. Um, and uh, at the same time, I was, we lived in, in Connecticut, and I was going birding with people from the New Haven Bird Club and at Lighthouse Point Park in East Haven, and um, learning a lot of stuff about bird identification and learning a lot of things from these other birders and realizing that very little of it was actually in the field guides. The, the guides at the time were the Peterson Guide and the um, Birds of North America, illustrated by Arthur Singer, right. which Robinson, were, were yeah. great books, but pretty limited in the number of field marks that they either illustrated or mentioned. So there were all kinds of tricks that people were teaching me that weren't, weren't in the books. Yeah, so you could and see that you had a, a mission, so to speak. There was a, yeah. there was a book in your head that was going to be different from these other books. Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I, one of the things that interests me about your, your work, going, going back to the, the first book, um, is that my perception is that, again, I, my background, although a generation earlier, but, um, you know, Peterson was the book, and um, strikingly sort of diagrammatic in its, in its and that was intentional, mm -hmm. of course, and whatever, mm -hmm. and his famous arrows and all of that. And when Arthur Singer came out with his book, when Chan Robinson and Arthur Singer came out with The Birds of North America, one of the things, obviously you always want to have it be different and a, a new approach and all that, and there were a number of features in, in that book, but one of them was that the birds were uh, painted in a way to make them look livelier, that is to say they were less diagrammatic. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that one of the things that you do in the book, which I, you know, um, 
greatly approve of, basically, is that in a way, I, I don't want to call it a step back, but you, you in a way went back to a, a more standardized approach so that you could compare, uh, you know, Dowagers, for example, mm -hmm. uh, in a very clear way, without having to sort out the fact that, you know, the, the living postures and trying to get some behavior in, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, resonate at all? Is that yeah, that? yeah. That was a very conscious yeah. decision. Um, I uh, I knew that. Well, uh, the fundamental um, function of a field guide is comparing one illustration to another. Um, and so I, I thought making all of the illustrations as easy as possible to compare with each other was really the key to uh, a good field guide. So I knew that I wanted to have every species facing the same direction, all facing to the right, um, which was just a coin, just a coin toss. Like, no, I, I, I did not puzzle over that. It, was, it just happened. Um, uh, and every species in a straight profile view to show the the shape um, to make it easy to compare the shape of of one bird with another and um, and on all the plumages the different plumages the birds in flight all lined up across the pages in a fairly orderly way um, and also um, specifically what you were just mentioning, the, the idea of stripping out all of the extraneous bits. And um, I think that's really important to, there's very little, or the, there's only certain bits of information that are important for identifying birds. And I thought, felt like if I were to add habitat to a, an illustration, it suggests a scene, it suggests an experience, and it might not be the experience that you just had. So it's sort of a barrier then to you um, incorporating that image into what you've just seen, um, if that makes sense. That the Very much so. Huh? What you want is a blank slate that looks like the bird so that what you've just seen will immediately match. No. And if it's surrounded by water or green leaves it's or something else, no. it might not be what you just saw. No. So that suggests to me another question. Now, since um, within the last few decades or whatever, as I guess as bird guides uh, became more popular and birding became more popular, uh, we began to see photographic guides, mm -hmm. and um, and lots of them. And and a remark when when uh, new birders ask me about that their immediate reflection is that, oh, well, you know, the photographic guides are better because that's the real bird, you know, there it is. Um, I have my own opinions about that and, and, and relay them to folks and say, you know, work on this. But I'd be interested in hearing your, uh, how you feel about that uh, dichotomy, you know, with illustrated guides versus photo guides. Yeah, well, that, that ties in exactly with what I was just saying, that yeah. the... Um, a photograph is is a record of one bird at one instant in time, and it's it's the experience you're sharing the experience that the photographer had at that moment of whatever the bird was doing, what the weather was like, the lighting, the the um, the surroundings, um, and that has a lot of value. But as a field guide, it it means that you, when you look at that photograph, you have to strip away, in your mind, strip away all of the, the experiential parts of that image and latch onto the, the key parts of, or the key features of the bird. Um, Which you often can't see in a photograph. Uh, yeah. You know, critical pieces, you know. Yeah, and it even extends to um, things like the posture of the bird. Um, so what I've illustrated in the guide is my sort of idealized impression of the shape of each of these species. Yeah. Um, but you could go out and take thousands of photographs of any of these birds and not a single one of them would match the shape that I've drawn because it's not, it's probably not a shape that ever 
occurs in real life. It's just the impression that you get from watching a bird and your mind sort of blends together a few seconds worth of movement and um, uh, action and you get an impression of, of the overall shape of the bird. Yeah, but a yep. yeah, photograph is always going to have the head turned, the crest raised, the tail cocked, the wings drooped. A shadow um, falling on a place that you know, yeah, is, is irrelevant. The minute. So it's, your, it's really your expert selection of the bird's features <laughs> that make an illustration you know, ideal as a field guide, uh, you know, for a field guide, rather than, as you say, this spot shot in time. Yeah, yeah no, it's very interesting. Um, we should talk about the new book. <laughs> um, I guess uh, the first thing I'm wanting to ask, is, especially not having seen it, is how, how you think about, well, um, you know, at, at what point did you go, oh, um, here are a whole bunch of new accumulated things in my head that aren't in the first edition or whatever, and, um, and, and wh what, is, what is all the new stuff in the new book? Uh, yeah, well, I started collecting new information for it um, as soon as the first edition went to press, <laughs> there were new things, um, new things that I was learning, um, and it's been 14 years now. So a lot has happened in the birding world in 14 years. Um, yeah. uh, a lot of new information has come out. Um, the explosion of digital photography and birding has made an incredible amount of information available to anyone with a computer. And um, the research for the revision was so much easier <laughs> than the research mm -hmm. for the first one. Um, a lot of species that I had a really hard time finding photographs of for the first book, like um, red-footed booby, were just uh, you know, 0.038 seconds on Google, and <laughs> I had 10,000 results. So. Um, uh, so I, um, I had a long list of things that I wanted to add to the new book, um, things I wanted to change. And then it, like any book, once I started working on it, it became a series of compromises, of long lists of new illustrations I wanted to add, and, and uh, only about half of them made it into the book. Um, uh, a lot of new text that was whittled down and edited down to squeeze onto the page. Um, and uh, some other ideas of things that, in the end, I didn't want to mess too much with the basic format of the book, which I think worked really well. So um, uh, I was kind of back to, um, you know, one of the, when I was uh, about probably 15 years old, one of my ideas for a bird book, and this is back to my, my early adventures in field guides, um, I, I started working on a book that would show every single feather or every distinctive feather type of every bird. And I, I have a Whoa. few sketches that I did of things like um, 30 different feathers from a northern flicker and what each feather looks like. So I got sketches done for a couple of species. <laughs> <laughs> By that time you were 17, project. probably. <laughs> <laughs> but that was the same kind of feeling that I had as I started to work on this, this revision, that there's so much stuff I wanted to put into it, and um, once again, constrained by the, <laughs> the limitations mm -hmm. of the, uh, the printed page, and, um, and trying to fit it into the, the format of the original guide. Right. So, uh, so how how many there are X number of new paintings of of what? Yeah, about six hundred new paintings. Wow. And um, it's sort of probably evenly split between. Um, well, it's probably mostly for new species that were added to the guide, and that includes a lot of rare species like pink-footed goose, which is now not quite so rare. They yeah. show up almost every winter, or they have shown up every winter the last few years somewhere in New England. Um, but at the time the first book came out, there were only uh, a handful of records in North America. Um, uh, and a few other species like green-breasted mango that has increased um, 
since the first book came out. Um, and I added a lot of slightly rarer species just um, to, to expand the coverage of the book a little bit. Species like Eurasian kestrel, um, yellow-nosed albatross that have been seen 10 or 20 times in North America. They're still extremely rare, but they're species that the average birder might at least hear about yep. in over the course of a few years. So did you have a cutoff? Did you have like a species that has been seen 10 times or more you'd include it or just a, just a gut? Yeah, I didn't have a hard rule for it. Right. Just sort of a, uh, right. yeah. a, and it was really came down to species that I thought the average birder um, might encounter or might, uh, uh, and with in the broad sense of encounter, meaning that they might read about it on the internet or right, see yeah. photos or meet somebody who had seen one. Yeah. Or maybe uh, be inspirational. I mean, I remember when I was a kid, looking at a field guide was inspirational. I remember when mm -hmm. Dick Poe's, when the Western Poe Guide came out and it had all this amazing stuff like spoon-billed sandpiper and it was yeah. like, gotta see that kind of. So I'm sure yeah. there were young birders who see your thing of a yellow-nosed albatross and think, oh, that yeah. could, that's a possibility. Kind yeah. of, so that's an important piece. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, we should open things up here to the audience and see um, who has questions for, for David. All right, please. In the front row or in the second row there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the type of paint that I use is called gouache. It's um, opaque watercolor. And it's, um, I learned about it when I was 13 or so. It's what, what all the bird illustrators use. So <laughs> I started practicing with it and um, it's been perfect for the things that I need to do. It's opaque, so it's watercolor, so it's easy to work with and really convenient. It comes in tubes, but you can let it dry on the palette and just moisten it and use it whenever you need it. Um, and it's, you can put it on in layers and build up layers of color um, to develop more subtle shadings and textures and patterns, um, much more so than, uh, well, with a lot more control than you ever have with transparent watercolors. So uh, gouache is the medium of choice. Um, and as far as the ebook, um, there is an app available. Um, the first edition of the book has been uh, turned into an app um, with and and sounds are also included and and some other things um, and we're working on converting the new revised edition into an app as well and that hopefully will be out later this year. Um, this kind of book really doesn't work as an ebook because the whole uh, the whole value of ebooks is that the text flows onto as many screens as you need to fit it, um, and you can't do that with this book. Each page is a is a unit that needs to be seen all on its own. Um, besides, it's all images, and the the <laughs> the file would be very large that would, you would have to uh, download. Um, the app is about. Um, um, it's 400 megabytes, I think, which is small for a bird app, but still, it's a very large file. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a very interesting world right now, the electronic media. Um, I think the ebooks are advancing and evolving, and there might be a sort of hybrid ebook app um, that comes along. It would be good if there was some kind of hybrid ebook app format that could be used for reference books like this. If there are any software engineers in the crowd, there's an idea for it. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot of reference books out there that need an easy, an easy electronic digital conversion. They don't work as ebooks, um, and it's very expensive and time consuming to to customize an app for each one. I'm sure Google will soon have glasses so that you can see the bird <laughs> through the glasses and then this part will show an identification piece and match them and yep. and you can just stay home and look out your window, I guess. So, anyway, right. <laughs> so what else? Who else? Uh, gentleman with the goatee in the room there. Do you uh, use bird scans to come up with the exact heights and different uh, scales? I mean, can't we just guessing the scale of the bird? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the question is, do I use bird skins? And is it is the question, how do I come up with the numbers like lengths and wingspans? Um, yeah. Those. Um, uh, the numbers come from uh, yes, from measuring specimens and. Um, but also, I'm, it's difficult to measure specimens. They, uh, they're not always prepared exactly the same. Uh, different species will come out uh, in, in different ways that are a little misleading. So I, I, um, I started with a basic set of measurements and then sort of went through and, and fudged what uh, <laughs> seemed, seemed right. <laughs> <laughs> so, Very sort scientific. of a combination of <laughs> what you were asking. That um, so, if I know, um, say, I know that gray-cheeked thrush should be just a little bit bigger than hermit thrush. They look a little bit bigger in the field, and even if the measurements that come from specimens don't quite show that, I'll give the gray-cheeked thrush an extra quarter inch or so. And <laughs> and make you it use, a little bigger. Do you also, did you also use skins at all for other details? I mean, you're obviously looking in the field and you've got photographs, but also, yeah. Yeah, so that's yeah I yeah. spent a lot of time in museums. museums that was my father's workplace, so I grew up behind, behind the scenes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> inhaling yeah. mothballs at, in the bird collection at Yale. Um, and uh, the specimens are incredibly important for that kind of detail work. I use them for research. Um, but not for the actual painting. So I have pages of notes where I'm comparing different subspecies or um, looking, comparing males, females, adults, immatures, looking for the, the details that distinguish plumages or species. Um, but once I get back in the studio, I'm just looking at photographs and sketches and, and those notes. Right. right. This gentleman down here had his hand up for a while. Yeah, the question is how much photography do I do? Um, uh, very little. Um, and more now that it's so easy with the digital camera. Um, but I, um, at one point I, I thought that photography would be a great help to me in my research. And I got a camera, and this was back in the days of film and slides. I got a camera with a uh, long lens and I started carrying it around and taking pictures of birds but typically it would take me you know, weeks or sometimes months to actually get to a place where I could mail in the film to have it developed and get the slides <laughs> back and when I got the slides back I was looking at birds that I couldn't remember even seeing <laughs> and I realized that when when I'm taking pictures myself, I was concentrating on framing the picture, focusing, setting the exposure, and waiting for, that, waiting for the bird to turn its head the right way so that I could snap the picture to get the profile view that I wanted for reference. And I wasn't even looking at the bird. Mm. And to me, the sketches, um, all these scraps of paper that I have that are covered with little um, half-finished quick outlines of birds, those are incredibly valuable just for the process, just for the experience of um, interviewing the bird, like I was saying. And when I'm looking through the camera, I wasn't really paying attention to the bird, I was paying attention to the camera. So, yeah. so I put the camera away and went back to just sketching, and I used... Um, I have a lot of photographer friends who would give me their photos that they didn't want and um, uh, a lot of books and other references for photos um, back in the old days. That's great. I'm going to move around the hall a little bit and not just make sure I get some people. The lady in the pink scarf. Yeah, so some of my favorite places for birding. I, uh, well, I, I started 
Um, after college, um, I <laughs> got a, I, I, well, I moved to Cape May, New Jersey then. What would have been my sophomore year in college, I got a job counting hawks at Cape May. And that became my home base for the next, um, well, a lot of the next 20 years from 1980 to 2000. It's just, so that's the simplest answer. My favorite place for birding in North America is Cape May. It's um, for uh, sort of bang for the buck, the, the best variety, the most exciting birding that you can see um, from your front steps um, is Cape May. The, the migration, it, it's a funnel for southward migration. Um, every bird, every land bird migrating south through New Jersey, um, they try to stay over land as long as they can and it funnels them right to the tip of Cape May. And there are some incredible experiences there, like I um, woke up one morning in October, one, one fall, and um, before sunrise there were great blue herons calling from the sky overhead, which was not that unusual in migration. You'd hear a lot of migrating herons calling at night. Um, but this day there were a lot of them, and as the sky got light, there were thousands of great blue herons. Um, the estimate for that day was something like 3,700 great blue herons that were at Cape May, and they were just at all levels, some 5,000 feet up, some 3,000, some just over the treetops, just milling in all directions in flocks and lines, all calling, and that was a really extraordinary day at Cape May, but even on the very ordinary days, there are constantly birds moving. It's a place where Every bird watcher who lives there keeps the binoculars around their neck all the time because really, as you're carrying your groceries from the store to your car, <laughs> a golden eagle might fly over. So I can't help but ask, what are you doing living in Massachusetts? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, a lot of reasons, but um, the, uh, I had two kids and they were just ready to start school and um, the Massachusetts schools looked a little better than the Cape May public schools, so. And the birding's not too bad here. The birding is quite good. Yeah. <laughs> and are your, that brings up another subject, are your boys, your teenage boys you got uh, now, I think, uh, yeah. are they into this, or is that dad's thing and? They're, yeah, they're not really <laughs> into it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see, somebody in the balcony maybe? Anybody up there got a question? No, okay. Uh, get somebody, somebody okay yeah the lady in the middle yeah yeah that's that's right I should have uh, answered the rest of your question <laughs> I interrupted my fault <laughs> yeah the amount of travel that I did I um, after I, I ended up at Cape May and after uh, a year or so there I I started traveling all over North America um, I had a couple of friends who were my birding travel companions. We made long trips to California, Arizona, and then I got a camper van and I started traveling on my own full time. So I would leave, leave Cape May and drive west for six months or eight months um, and drive out to the coast of California and camp out and just watch birds. And I find places, I don't think I'd be able to do this, certainly not as easily now, but in the 80s there were a lot of free campsites, and there were even books. There was a book of the free campsites of North America, tips on finding free places to park where you could sleep in your van. Um, and most of it was pretty normal and safe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably a little different. Yeah. Um, but it was great. I could go into the national forests in Arizona, Colorado, California, and just drive back on some forest road into the middle of nowhere and park and go birding for a week, and then drive out and get groceries and go somewhere else. Um, so that was more or less how I lived for about six years in the late 80s, um, just birding full time and traveling. That's great. What else? Anybody over in the section? Yes, sir. <laughs> yes. 
So many questions about pelagic birds. There are a lot of the species that were added were, were pelagic birds, the tube noses, albatrosses, petrels, storm petrels. Um, that's partly a result of all the new exploration that's gone on in the last 15 years offshore, especially off Cape Hatteras, but also California. Um, more boat trips have been going out farther out to sea and exploring different times of year and different places. Um, and have found a lot of species like um, um, Hawaiian petrel and black-bellied storm petrel and European storm petrel and several others are now have been found multiple times in the last 15 years where there were essentially no records before that. Um, uh, many of those species I have never seen. Um, I did not have a chance to get out on a lot of pelagic birding trips in the last 15 years, so painting those species was difficult because I, uh, I don't know them personally. Um, fortunately, a lot of them are very similar to species that I do know, other species in the same genus, so I could take what I do know and use photographs of those species to, uh, to do those paintings. Um, in the past, I did take a lot of pelagic birding trips. I spent a lot of time on boats, um, even though I do get seasick. <laughs> I get over it after a couple of days. Um, so I spent, along with a lot of day trips, um, two weeks on a, two and a half weeks on a research cruise off the coast of California and five weeks on a research cruise in the Bering Sea around the Pribilof Islands. Um, which was really miserable, <laughs> but great, great birding. Um, and I can do quick sketches on the boat. Um, I'll have my sketchbook handy and, and be able to watch a bird. Um, Near the rail. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and um, even in fairly rough weather, um, with some practice, you can sort of brace yourself against something and hold your binoculars. <laughs> And, and watch a bird that's um, moving past. And um, I should, um, this, uh, it, it almost came up earlier, but one of the, the tricks that I use when I'm sketching birds in the field, um, anything like a warbler or a, a flying bird, anything that's moving quickly, it's the years of practice and sketching over and over. So what I have in my head is sort of a template of that bird or a generic related species. Um, so if I'm on a boat and a, a seabird flies by, I can get my binoculars on it, even if it's just for five or 10 seconds, and latch onto a few, um, a few critical details of wing shape, tail shape, um, color pattern, and then quickly sketch the generic template modified with those details. So I don't have to see, I don't have to take in every single detail of that observation. I'm, I'm really just noticing a few specific things and then putting them on the paper surrounded by what I knew before. Yeah, it's like you've got a template yeah. in your head of all these different generic forms in a way. And yeah. You can kind of fill in details. Yeah, I noticed that working with Lars, he could do that. He, he had the bird so so much in his head and, and knew, you know, and could connect it to his hand that with a few strokes of the brush he could, su he could suggest, you know, that bird just without, I don't know, yeah. without thinking or, you know, whatever. Remarkable, I mean, really. What else? Who else? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so the first question is, how did I support myself for all those years? And the, um, the simple answer is by controlling costs. <laughs> um, I lived very cheaply, um, free campsites. Um, my only expenses were the sort of maintenance of the van and uh, food. Um, and I worked for a tour company called Wings um, starting in the mid-1980s, I led birdwatching tours for wings um, to different places around North America, like the Dry Tortugas in Florida and 
Churchill, Manitoba, and Cape May. So I would, my, my solo birding traveling would be interrupted maybe five times a year by going to an airport and flying somewhere to join a group of people to go birding. <laughs> and I got paid for that. And that working that 50 or 60 days each year leading tours was enough to support my uh, travel for the rest of the year. Um, and behavior. Was oh, behavior was your second question. How behavior informs all the rest of the, yeah, it's really, well, behavior, understanding behavior is really critical for bird watching. And I've, honestly, I've come to realize that m more and more, even in the last couple of years, how much I use behavior as a clue for identifying birds. Um, and it's really simple things that you, a lot of you probably do without even thinking about it, but if you see a bird engaged in any kind of nesting behavior, well, it's obviously going to be a bird that is likely to nest in the area. It's not going to be a vagrant from Siberia or the West Coast or anything exotic. It's going to be a local breeding species, and that really limits the possibilities. So then, if you get better at recognizing nesting behavior, just the way a bird moves, the way it responds to um, an owl call or a pishing um, can give you the idea that it's a local breeder and then right away you're into a very limited number of, of species as possibilities. Um, I think that uh, as behavior, I was always watching behavior um, in a more pragmatic sort of way for identification, watching the way a bird um, the way it walks, the way it flaps, the way it moves its tail, um, and trying to take notes on all of that and trying to find ways to capture that in sketches to sort of suggest the movement, the different movements of different species. But they do all the, a lot of the birds have different gaits, different ways of walking. Um, there's very different flight styles. Um, every aspect of flight from the way a bird lands, the way it approaches for a landing is different in different species, different families of birds, um, along with the undulating or not undulating, the, the exact um, movement of the wings during the wing beats, all of those things. So I was watching all of that, looking for clues to identification and taking in all of the other behavior just as a way to help me find birds and identify them. And I believe you said that that's also something that's added to the book, that you've added more text and probably more of those details that you've just kind of been describing. Yes. Yeah, I did add, um, there's a little, a new bit of text next to the map that's all about status and habitat and, and some little um, bits of behavior. That's great. Yeah, it's really, I mean, identification is really a process of elimination, eh? And it's, mm -hmm. you know, where you are, um, and then all of those details, not just of field marks, not just wing bars and whatever, but the, you know what birders sometimes call jizz, just how a bird looks, kind of. Yeah, and, yeah. No, that's great. Right. More questions, lady? What? Couple more. Couple more, lady Good. with the yeah, you. <laughs> What's your favorite bird? <laughs> uh, my favorite was it the hardest to draw? You said. F favorite was first, favorite, yeah. yeah. And the second part was the hardest to draw. Um, well, my favorite bird, I don't, I can't pick a favorite. Yeah. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> <There. Yeah. laughs> um, you have I a favorite have, group of I birds. I have a long list. No, not even a favorite not even that? group. No. No. Okay. Okay. no, you're not going to pin me down. Yeah. <laughs> um, All birds are equal. Uh, <laughs> but that said, long-eared owl is... Uh, right up there. Um, and, uh, um, and the second part, um, uh, the hardest, well, for the hardest birds to draw, um, uh, as a group, I've always sort of struggled with um, herons, the herons and egrets, um, that, that combination of graceful and prehistoric, um, they, uh, I found a real challenge to draw um, and f never 
felt like I never quite got comfortable with it. Um, uh, but the most difficult birds in the field guide, the, or the ones that I was least happy with the illustrations of, are the the group of the most common species that I've, like uh, rock pigeon, crow, robin, starling, the birds that I've seen sort of every day since I was seven years old. Um, and uh, I, I think the best explanation I've come up with is that when what I'm trying to do in the field guide is, is just to condense all of my experience into a few images and that those species I don't have I've seen them so many different times and places and they're just sort of the generic background birds that I see and I I don't have a good clear um, image that I can um, so it's like image overload you've got so many kind of pieces yeah. that you can't really do what you described before and consolidate that into one image kind of. Work. Yeah, and when I try to when I try to make an image that looks like like every robin, it, uh, it, <laughs> it doesn't can, work. It can't happen. So. <laughs> so maybe one more question uh, over in this part. Yeah, the lady with the strike. Yeah. Hey, um, so can you talk a little about your experiences in the, the process of getting published in this field? Because I think that's something that people don't really understand. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. I, don't know. <laughs> I didn't have that experience. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> uh, I I worked on this book. Um, well, like we've been talking about, I was thinking about a field guy when I was a teenager, um, and I started working on or sort of committed to working on a field guide when I was um, uh, I was about 27, 1988. I committed to doing this book. I finally said, this, this is what I want to do. This is the project I'm going to work on. And six years later, I had figured out how I wanted the pages to be laid out. I had filled in the gaps in the research. I had worked on my painting style and gotten comfortable with the field guide illustration. Um, and uh, coincidentally, at just that time, a friend of a friend, one of, one of the people I did some of my uh, country-spanning travel with, he knew someone who was working for a publisher in New York and the publisher was thinking about doing a field guide and through that connection a meeting was set up and I brought um, some of the sample pages that I had been working on um, and they offered me a contract. So. That's my long, sad story <laughs> of searching <laughs> for a <her> book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so maybe one more. Okay, uh, let's see. So, gentleman way in the back there. You mean for the science, for science? And conservation, you know, sort of what's the, what's the impact? Uh -huh. Like some other fields of science, like astronomy, um, a lot of the field work of ornithology now is being done by amateurs, um, non-professionals. And um, so a book like mine is a, it's a guide to the species, 
um, it's a it helps people get out there and and or it sort of categorizes all the biodiversity of birds in North America it helps people to uh, get a handle on that and it's I think it's sort of a, a basis for further work so as as um, the regional variations are, of species are sorted out um, there's still some distinctive regional populations of birds waiting to be discovered I think in North America um, and um, new new discoveries about that are made every year um, and most of that is done by amateurs by people using field guides and just really getting to know their local birds and, and noticing that something is different between say the birds that show up in the winter compared to the ones that are there in the summer or whatever and if I can if I can add that in the sort of the broader picture um, you know bird watching has just burgeoned you know uh, it's become you know it's the most popular sort of outdoor activity ahead of golf ahead of gardening ahead of fishing uh, etc and as books like David's have come out that interest has spread to you know sort of worldwide I mean Europe uh, has always been pretty a uh, lot of birders there Japan but in the developing world uh, you know 30 years ago uh, there were no uh, decent guides and now there are dozens of excellent guides and that has created again this pool of enthusiastic amateurs and bird watchers from this country traveling to those places which means that uh, local bird guides can make a, a living you know when I, I do a lot of bird uh, tour leading kinds of things and have done it for you know since the 1970s and in those days there, there were no local guides and, and I think with the emergence of field guides, this has created a whole new industry, a whole new interest, and has certainly promoted uh, science, finding new species, you know, worldwide, especially in the tropics and places yeah. or whatever.